about the car, you know, it, it, electronic ignition, air conditioning, all the terms from the car, anti-lock brakes, but nobody knows how to actually build them, you know, so I'm trying to introduce a bunch of concepts in the book um, so people now are from, familiar with the terminology about it. So that's, that's what we'll, that's what I'll talk about in the last half dozen slides. So, so, you know, I've been interested in quantum computing for a long time. So I came up with the, my last name is too hard to spell. So I came up with the moniker quantum Doug. And so quantumdug.com is my website and Doug at quantum Doug is my email. So I'm an IEEE senior life member. I've been programming for over 50 years now um, since I started programming in when I was in high school in the, in the late sixties. The thing that got me interested in physics and quantum computing in particular, I was the chairman of FISCOMP 92 and 94, and we had uh, a session um, about um, the kinds of things I did for my book. So one of the guys from that, those sessions, um, you know, was like my fifth wheel on my dissertation. Um, his, his name was Mike Manthe. So, so I've written a lot of papers, patents. One of the key talks is this talk, this paper I wrote, will physical scalability sabotage performance gains? And what's interesting about this, it was the lead off article in 1997 in the um, special issue of IEEE Computer Society called the future of processors. And it was basically the future of processors was talking about, well, what would a billion transistor processor look like? And this paper is now required reading for anybody who has any kind of architecture class, because it shows that as semiconductor processes keeping getting smaller and smaller and smaller, wires actually get worse. So the physical scalability of wires is the thing that sabotage performance gains. So it basically shows computer architecture doesn't scale anymore um, because of that. And so it's an important consideration. And we predicted, you know, five years before it happened that the first billion transistor processor was going to be a multiprocessor for that reason alone. And that's what happened exactly. So um, I got my master's degree in 1980 at UT Austin when I was still here in, in uh, Austin in 1980, and then I moved to Dallas. And then I got my PhD in quantum computing in 2002 at UT Dallas. And I did it, you know, like anything for a PhD, you have to do something novel. So I used a different kind of math called geometric algebra um, to build, show that I could do quantum computing. So, um, and, that's, and that's essentially what I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight too when I talk about the book. Then I proceeded to go and finish my dissertation and work on neural and quantum computing. Got a million dollar grant, um, SBAR grant. I left TI at that point and, um, and got a, uh, a SBIR grant for a million dollars and worked and showed that neural computing and quantum computing are really related. They both have phase angles. They both have probabilities. They both have information theoretic concepts. Uh, so, so realize that those things are related. So, and then the book, of course, the book just came out in October um, and uh, it's written by uh, a, a Stanford emeritus professor called William Tiller. And he's, he's well known in his field um, that's related to the book. And we call this topic source science. I also call it bit physics or proto physics. So, so those are the concepts that we'll be talking about. So, so let's talk about the main topic of the paper here is we're gonna talk about quantum computing. Well, why is quantum computing so interesting? Well, you know, because Richard Feynman basically said, there's a lot of room down there. And he said this in like in the fifties, you know, he was basically saying, if you keep looking at quantum compute, quantum properties, you know, that we were much bigger than any of the quantum properties that he cared about. And so he thought we could keep scaling forever. And of course, then Moore's law came out in the early seventies and they basically said, oh, we're gonna have semiconductor processes get 50% smaller every two years. And so if you plot that on a log graph like this, um, then you get this technology curve. And basically everybody's been competing, not against each other, but to stay on this curve, because if they didn't, other people were, and you were gonna lose out. So this became sort of uh, the basis for um, all the quantum, com all the computing um, for the last 50 years. And, but also you can see this blue thing here is the Dow Jones industrial average, um, is that the Dow Jones kind of like, was you know, a lot of impetus because of the um, semiconductor growth and that, that's helped our entire industry. So, but at some point here in the 20s and 2020 and 2030, you see that there's a divergence because you no longer can build it any smaller. You might be able to build it smaller, but the cost will go up per unit because it takes you so much technology to build smaller and smaller things using X-rays or whatever 
for your masks and it becomes slower because you can't use uh, x-ray light sources that are done essentially masking in parallel. And so, so this graph here is the ideal is the, is the red line. Um, and you know, some people said, oh yeah, we're gonna have single transistor atoms. And I don't believe in any of those predictions. I believe the sort of the red one on the bottom where it's really gonna, it's gonna bottom out. And so I was interested in quantum computing because I was saying, well, what's so different about quantum computing that allows us to do something about Moore's law, okay? Uh, so that was sort of the justification for, for this. So, so when you start looking at quantum computing, well, it really comes from quantum physics, right? And so there's all this, just realize there's all this strange stuff and I'm not expecting you all to, to learn about all this stuff. Again, I'm just giving you a kind of an introduction, a buzzword thing about this because first of all, you have this particle wave duality, okay? Um, and part of this particle wave duality is you have this superposition of states. And, and it was introduced that this guy Schrodinger uh, had his cat and he was wondering if you could have macroscopic version of wave duality and you could have the cat both half alive and half dead. So these are the concepts that sort of came from the history of quantum physics and, and it shows up in quantum computing as well. So you have these quantum states, you have quantum probabilities you from, from a semiconductor perspective and, and you have quantum tunneling. Obviously you have quantum noise, you have quantum measurement. What does that mean? You have coherence and decoherence. If you have this quantum state, well, if you disturb it with noise or measurement, then it's no longer in this quantum state. And we're gonna tell you in a few minutes here why this state is coherent, why it's so valuable, okay? And of course the problem is, is that you can't clone quantum state. It's like, not only can you not, not only can you not, um, reliably measure quantum computing, but you can't copy it either. So you, you, there's a certain amount of uncertainty associated with the quantum state and that's part of its mystery. It's also part of its um, power, okay? And so you have the Heisenberg uncertainty principle also, which is part of physics and Heisenberg certainty, and I'm gonna have a slide more about that later. So I'm just kind of giving you some buzzwords here to talk about the kinds of things that are all related to quantum computing and that comes from quantum physics. So, but the other thing about quantum computing is, is that it's reversible. So a lot of people looked at reversible phase computing um, and, and you can compute with no energy when you start looking at reversible computing. So that's another concept that came out of quantum, quantum computing, okay? Also, you, there's a lot of things you can learn on the web. There's this website, there's these Dr. Quantum on YouTube and Fred Allen Wolf is a car, cartoon character. It's actually probably 20 years old already, but uh, he has some really great um, stuff out there. There's also a PBS Space Time on YouTube, and there's others, uh, quite a few others that I like. Um, they're all related to time, quantum physics, and teaching people about quantum physics. So, so those are a bunch of good resources. So the first thing I want to remind y'all is that, well, in 1992, I had Ralph Landauer from IBM um, as my keynote speaker for that FizComp 92 conference, and he, he sort of, in, he was a pioneer because in 1961, he said, um, he said, well, information is physical. And he argued that you, if, you, if you erase information, you can't just ignore it. You have to compensate for it in the thermodynamic sense. So he says, well, a bit is equal to KT log n log two of uh, worth of energy. And so it turns out in the last five years, they actually measured this and it matches the, in other words, this is really low energy compared to our normal computers, but in the, in the limits, um, if you, you can also think about this as billiard ball computers, that anytime you have a bit, it's like a billiard ball bouncing around and it's reversible. You can go in either direction with it. But if you erase a billiard ball, where does it go? And if you have to create one, how do you create it? So that's the energy of the creation of the information or destruction of information. So that's what we're talking about affecting thermodynamics. And so therefore this reversible computing is essential to quantum computing because if you erase information like, which is what you do in a measurement, then you can't go back to where you were because you've lost it. So this notion of reversible computing is essential to um, both noise and measurement. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you erase the information, you can't go back. And I have specific results that I did came as a result of my dissertation that I found out that was related to this, okay? So also physics, they know that the, the bit is the smallest increment to a black hole. You go, well, but, but a bit is a computer science thing. Not anymore. It's actually bit is a physics. It's in physics now. It's not just in mathematics and computer science. And it's essentially 
it's it's the entropy is the is the is the surface area of the black hole, but its units are in bits, and their Planck area is worth of bits. In fact, the smallest discrete increment you can change a black hole is a bit, and in the limit you can show that that's the case. And so John Wheeler, who was from the University of Texas here in um, back when he was alive, he used the term it from bit, you know, and basically everything comes from bits. And so these are the concepts, if you go read about John Wheeler and it from bit, it shows this graphic down here, this, essentially this is the black hole with its surface area as bits down on the left, okay? So then you have, again, we just talked about particle wave duality and certainty principle, but all of this stuff is, information is physical. So you go, well, a lot of what computer science uh, does and what um, quantum computing does is it's such mathematical. But if you know that it's physical, then you have to sort of connect the engineering side of the physics and the, and the entropy side of the physics with the, with the math part of it. And, 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 and that's the hard part of it for people to get their head around, okay? And, and one of the things, you know, that I'm using this notion here that there's a quantum matrix out here, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but everything comes from these quantum dimensions. They even believe that empty space-time, you say, well, there's nothing in empty space-time. Well, that's not true. They believe that there's zero-point energy and quantum foam there, and that, and that it's frothing with quantum potential out there, and these virtual particles appear and disappear. Well, where does that stuff come from? And, and my point is the entire physical universe emerges from these quantum hyperdimensions. And you can think about it even at the Big Bang, that the quantum hyperdimensions, since they're really mathematical, they may have preceded the physical universe. In fact, they may have been the cause of the physical universe. So all of a sudden you have these purely, you know, I'm joking when I say this, but I'm kind of tongue in cheek. I'm saying, well, if God wanted to create the universe and he didn't have anything to create it with, he would use bits and these hyperdimensions. And so, you know, that's, that's my tongue in cheek way of saying, well, how do you create something from nothing? So, um, so, but the point is the classical universe must emerge from the quantum hyperdimensions. So, so here's this talk a little bit about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle basically says that these, the, the momentum and the position are, they're related, they're connected. It's because they're duals. It's kind of like the frequency domain and the um, time domain are duals. In other words, if you have something that's infinite, like a certain frequency, it's has a very limited extent in the frequency domain, but has an infinite extent in the quantum domain, in the, in the time domain, and vice versa. If you have a bunch of frequencies in there, then it ends up being limited in the, in the temporal domain, but extended, uh, increased in the, in the temporal domain, in the frequency domain. So the same kind of, they're, they're duals of each other. Um, this duality is what's called non-commutative properties. And again, you have to know a little bit more about that math. And here's this joke about at home with the Heisenbergs. It says, the lady says, I can't find my keys. And her husband says, you probably know too much about their momentum. And basically this is, this is the same as the no cloning. You can't, you can't measure anything. And this comes right out of relativity. If you know something's time is so small or its distance is so small, then you know that its energy increases because the energy to fit in that small thing must be really high to have such a high wavelength. So you can, you can argue, you can think, think about it very systematically, think about that space and time are like fundamental properties that, that cause this community of property to exist, okay? So it, it affects our space-time models is, is really the key. So this is important to think about um, at a physics perspective, and I don't know, and it does affect quantum computing too because it might affect how long it takes for the quantum states to set up or something like that. So. So, so let's talk about waves because quantum physics is all about quantum states. These quantum, and I'm going to show you some equations in a little bit here about what that, what I mean by those. But essentially, they are distributed probability waves. In fact, this is a little icon I found out there on the web. You know, you can actually change sort of this particle likeness to the wave likeness, um, wave like or particle like property. You, it, you know, this is a continuum depending on what you're doing to it. And uh, we, talk, I talk, we talk about measurement and I'll talk about that again in a minute. So do you have photons and particles? All photons and particles are really quantized and they're really not particles, they're really waves. They're discrete, but they act like a wave. So it's like a discrete wave packet is probably a better way of thinking about it. And 
depending on what you're doing, you can either maintain the wave-like property or, you, or it sort of collapses into a particle-like thing, depending on the measurement. So these waves construct, even I was telling you about quantum foam, they even structure the, the Planck scale of space-time. And, and if you think about, Feynman came up with these much easier ways to think about this. He says Feynman diagrams, think about it as self-consistency over all paths. Well, what is consistency? It's like information theory, it's topology and it's consistency. It's really not energy, not in the sense of we think about energy as a conservation law, but this is a different kind of cons cons conservation law, conservation of different kinds of states, okay? So, um, so th those are all concepts, again, that are related to quantized waves. But the big one here is quantum tunneling. Anybody who's involved in semiconductors knows that the particle position is also its probability, has a probability amplitude. So it's a probability of where it is. And if you normally, if you have a physical particle, it hits the wall and if it doesn't have enough energy, it doesn't go through it, it bounces off. But a quantum probability amplitude is literally a mathematical structure. And it's non-zero through the barrier if it's thin enough. And so it doesn't go didn't diminish all the way to zero based on the thickness of the of this of this barrier. Okay, so there's a probability that part of it is going to be on the other side. And so if you do this experiment a bunch of time, that probability will actually occur, and you will actually see the electron or the particle tunnel through the barrier. Okay, so this is a superposition of position at the atomic and molecular scale. And one of the things you have to remember as wires get smaller and smaller and smaller that barrier essentially is the, is, is the, each wire is a, is a conductor, but the semiconductor part of it, the insulator between them is trying to keep the current in the conductor part, right? Well, if the, if the, if the insulator is so thin that it's now starting to exhibit quantum behavior, then the, then the electrons can actually tunnel right through the barrier between the gates. So this is another limit about quantum, uh, about how to build semiconductors because these, the insulators no longer are ideal and they start acting like quantum systems. Okay, so, so you can actually get the, these wave functions that look like this and this is like a plot of the potential wave functions of where, the, where they are in, in space. Okay, so you, you can't think of them as in one place. And this is true for at the uh, <coughs> at atoms as well. The atom model used to think it was like a nucleus and the, and the and electron is spinning around it. But really, it's a probability that it's around there, and it's, it has this distribution, and it can be anywhere around there. We think of it as spinning, but it's really not. It's literally a probabilistic wave that's the, some, it's somewhere around there, but it's not any particular place, because if it act, acted like a specific place, it would then be um, bound by, by particle physics and, and all that energy, because it was changing direction as it was rotating, would radiate away and, and quantum mechanics wouldn't work, and atoms wouldn't be stable. So, so we, we know that they have to be there um, to do this, okay? And then here's another picture of the Schrodinger's cat. You know, if you have a box that has a radioactive decay and a probability that 50-50 that the cat's either gonna be alive or dead, the question is, is it alive or dead? Or you only know that until you open it. So is the cat really also in the position of, of uh, half alive and half dead? And from a perspective of observation, that's a, a deep topic that people really don't know. And it turns out that this probability um, about where its location is happens at the molecular level. They've, they've done quantum inter interference with particles where the particles were as big as a buckyball. So, um, so it's not just electrons and photons, it's bigger things than that. In fact, all of chemistry requires you to use quantum physics Otherwise, chemistry would be too slow and it wouldn't work. So just realize that quantum is at every level um, in, in the universe, um, even at the chemistry levels, so, okay? So now we're gonna actually talk about the quantum computing primitives. I, that, what I was telling you, sort of like the background about the physics that goes into quantum computing. So now let's talk about quantum computing itself, okay? So it turns out what I, what I did for my dissertation, and this is totally compatible with what the normal view of quantum computing is. So I'm gonna kind of use these little diagrams to show you what I'm talking about here. But essentially a normally on the left-hand side here is a classical bit, what we call state one and state two, heads or tails, plus or minus. And generally it's like a coin, you can think of it as coin, that the heads is the head, is a vector pointing from the heads side of the coin and the tail 
vector is pointing at the tail side of the coin. And right, and normally if you have a coin, they're mutually exclusive. Only one of those vectors can be up at the same time, right? And in fact, if you tried to have both vectors at the same time, they would cancel each other out and, they, and the fact that they cancel each other, they sum to zero means it can occur. So that's one of the things that comes out of the mathematics I did for my dissertation, okay? So classical bits are like this. Well, what I did for my dissertation was showed that you can represent using a thing called geometric algebra, bits exactly this way. And if you do that, you end up getting, um, um, instead of having two states where you have a heads and a tail like this are mutually exclusive, you have two states where you have state zero and state one where the state zero is its own bit and state one is its other own bit. And now they're orthogonal, they're 90 degrees and they therefore you can have a phase angle between them. They're not mutually exclusive. And so they call this spin one half um, and, and you can think about this as a phase computing, okay? And because they're concurrent, see, we think of a register quantum, a, a, a bit, a set of bits in a register, in a computer register as concurrent, but they're really not, not like this. These, these dimensions are truly concurrent in the physics and the mathematics perspective, okay? So you can do things concurrency wise, doing things, running them in parallel that you can't do with regular um, classical bits, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about quantum registers, okay? So a classical uh, register in a, in a semiconductor or in a computer is different than a quantum register and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so this is simultaneity of states. Most people don't think about simultaneousness of states um, in a clear founded manner because partly because we don't have the math and we don't have the insights coming from that, okay? So, so where are these probabilities come from? This is a more typical graph that they show for qubits, the spin one half, but it looks exactly like the other one where these two notations here, this is the, you can think of this as the heads and this is the tails or vice versa. This is the zero state. This is called Brockett notation. And really nothing more than this is just a column vector in, in Hilbert space mathematics, okay? And literally it's a column vector, that's it. And so when you have two things that are orthogonal, that's what this means. This is, these are orthogonal to each other. They have a 90 degrees, their inner product, you can find something if their inner product is zero, that means that they are orthogonal, okay? And so you can do the math on these and you can find that the only way that you can take two things that are orthogonal to each other is you can sum them. You can't do anything else with them because they're like apples and oranges. They're independent of each other. They're linearly independent. This is the basis of all quantum computing and also all of quantum physics um, is this concurrency. So if you know anything about concurrency, this is the basics for everything that you wanna do in quantum physics, also in quantum computing, okay? And so what you find is that there's this coefficient here and these coefficients are, are complex numbers. So I'm not quite showing this whole graph here that coming out of the plane here, the coefficient for each one of this axis and this axis is another plane, which is the complex number. So essentially there are three dimensions here, X and Y and coming out of in and out of the, on, out of the um, page. And those are the complex numbers. And so, but you have this proper, prop, this property where, it's, where the, the sum of the squares of the um, comp coefficients equals, equals to one. It's because they have some, they're a probability, they set, set sum to one. But if you have three of these picked, the other fourth one is well known then. So it's really a three dimensional space represented as a, as a complex, you know, as a, there's some, there's some wiggle room in this fourth dimension because you have two complex numbers, but it's really a three dimensional space, okay? And so because of this, now you can get phase angles out of here. So you can have arguments, you can have operators that shift the angle of this even though you don't know what it is, you can say, I don't know what you are, but I wanna shift you by 45 degrees. And there are operators that do that, okay? You can either start at zero and go to 45, or you can start at 45 and go to state one. And so notice heads and tails here are not opposite of each other, like the, in the classical bit case, they are here in, the, in this particular case, they're 90 degrees. And that's the big difference about what a qubit is compared to a classical bit, okay? And notice that, in my representation for my dissertation, these two things that are orthogonal are really their own bits. And I can argue that they really are bits as well. 
if you, if you use the kind of math I did for my dissertation, okay? So once you have this notion that you have this state space like this with a phase angle, then you can have these gates. These are the operations that you can do on a, on a qubit, okay? And I'm gonna show you the mathematical operators here for it, but just realize that essentially there is some physics associated for how you implement this matrix operator for a qubit, okay? So here you have a quantum computer, it's a semiconductor-based quantum computer or some other kind of quantum computer. And there's some physics that allows you to build these gates so that you can ch change the phase angle by 45 degrees, okay? Change the phase angle by 30 degrees, okay? So, so these are all the things that, the kinds of things that you have is you can, the basic computing is nothing more than changes in phase. One of the famous phase gates is called the Hadamard gate. And that's the one where you shift it by 45 degrees. So you go from zero to 45 degree, and that's the Hadamard gate. Now, if you take the Hadamard gate and apply it twice, you get essentially the knot. So you go from zero to one. So you're inverting the state from state zero to state one. And so if you apply it twice, that's why this is called, the Hadamard gate is called the square root of knot because its square is not if you apply it twice. So multiplication, you, use, you do operations in quantum computing by doing multiplication. So you start out with this ket notation um, and you take multiply times a matrix operator, which is this matrix, and then you get the new result, which is another um, concurrent um, um, column vector, okay? And so realize that Hilbert space math has two separate kind of representations, one for the state and one for the operator. But this operator blows up with the number, it's the square of the number of dimensions, right? If you have, if you have, if you have two qubits, two, two states in your qubit here, this is for a single qubit, two states, then you have two by two in your matrix operator. So as you can imagine, if you had a hundred qubit system, you would have a hundred by hundred matrix. Um, well, this is, you'd have a 200 by 200 matrix and it would blow up extremely fast to have these matrix operators. So, um, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more when we talk about um, why quantum computing doesn't scale if you're simulating it, okay? But here are the poly, poly noise gates. This is essentially all noise is a form of one of these, okay? And again, this has complex numbers, which is why it's so hard to understand all this stuff because it has complex numbers in here, okay? So, one of the, so what I did for my dissertation was I took all of this and turned it into geometric algebra instead and showed geometric algebra is more like what an engineer would like to see rather than all this funny math that a physicist like to see, okay? But it's still the same thing. So that's what I showed during my dissertation, okay? So this is a single qubit operator. And you can see, even for a single qubit, you say, well, how do you compute anything with just a phase gate and a not gate and an invert gate? Oh, realize that the not is only 90 degrees, but an invert and the not are, the, are different. The not means go from plus zero state to minus zero state. Not, and, and, to in, and to say that that's the not, but if you invert it, that's what you do. You not, you go from zero state to one state, which is really a 90 degree change, okay? So again, getting your mind about this is computing in the quantum computer, uh, it's pretty, pretty different, okay? And that's the hard part of getting started on this. I mean, it took me three years during my dissertation to get my head wrapped around on this um, before I could really, really understand it um, um, to do this, okay? So, so once you have a qubit though, now you can take a measurement. So remember I showed you that position in space of a particle? Well, if you measure it, you get a classical bit out and you have some kind of what's called the, the collapse of the wave function. So all the quantum state probabilities go away and you end up having a single state, which is not a spread out probability anymore, okay? And generally you have a classical computer measuring the quantum computer like this. And noise can do the same thing, like we just showed you there. Noise can do the same thing, it acts like a measurement. So, um, and so you can have a state that you don't know what it is anymore because noise has per perturbed it or, or destroyed the coherence, okay? So this is, this is all how a quantum computer, you can log into the IBM website and go sign up to access their quantum computer and essentially this is what you're doing. There's this quantum computer back in the lab down there and you can go in and write little programs that program using this kind of 
phase gates to, to program the quantum computer to do that. And these quantum um, quantum register here, we're gonna talk about that now here in a minute. So, um, so, so what happens, you say, we well, can't do much with one qubit, right? Well, I'm agreeing with you. So what do you do if you have two qubits? Well, this is what's the definition of a quantum register, okay? And the way you specify a quantum register in the mathematics is you take this vector and this vector, which is the column vectors, and you call it what's called the tensor product, okay? All the tensor product is, is it takes a two, two two-dimensional spaces and turns it into one four-dimensional space. But it's different than that because if you have three qubits, two, three two-bit things, it blows it up into an eight-state um, matrix instead of, a, instead of a six. So it's an exponential growth on the number of states that you get. And that's part of the reason why quantum computers are so useful. So this quantum computer has two to the Q states. That's what we mean by a tensor product. And the mathematics, this is not pretty to understand. It's a lot easier to do it in geometric algebra. I'll show you that in a minute here. So what can you do with you have two qubits that you can't do with you have one qubit? Well, one of the things you can do is you can create what's called the Feynman gate. It's the control knot. Essentially what you're doing is you have a control bit, a Q qubit state, and somehow this qubit state can control the flipping of this other qubit state. And this is the matrix operator for that, where it's saying that if it comes in on this state, it goes out on this other state. So it comes in on three, but it comes in on three, but it goes out on four. Okay. And so that's what it's flipping the, the two states of this, of this uh, last qubit. You can think of these as the first two qubit, first qubit, and this is the second qubit. Okay. And there's another one called the swap control phase gate, where they both kind of flip each other. So, so these are matrix operators, and these matrix operators are reversible. In other words, you can go either direction with them. There's the reversible computing that I talked to you about. Same thing is true with these here in the previous state. These are all reversible too. You can go in either direction, okay? And you can apply them multiple times, okay? So, so this again, you said, well, this doesn't look very useful. This like, looks like an if then else gate. It's the beginning of an if then else, and that's probably true, um, is that, okay? So, but ultimately this is what you get if you have a bunch of qubits and you take Q, R, and S and you each of them have their own qubit with their two states and you take a quantum register, you get the quantum, the, the, this is the tensor product of those three, you get all of these states. And these are a label that says this is the part of the zero with Q, the Q qubit this is the state from the R qubit, and this is the state from the S qubit. So this is a notation that says, I'm using, this is the state, it's a single vector in the tensor product state space that is a culmination of these other three states in the lower dimensional states, space. And so this is a naming convention. This is called Hilbert space, and this is called the bracket notation, and this is the notation that they use in most of quantum computing, okay? And what's important about this, again, the, the complex coefficients um, square, some of them square to one because these are the probability. In other words, if you sum up all the probabilities here, you get one because you have to be essentially, if you have one of these states be 50%, the other state is 45%, then somewhere there has to be another 5%. You have to have all of these states to be exactly one because of the probability that's in some state. It can't be in none of those. So these are the naming conventions and how it expands. So what's interesting is, is if you have classical bits, you only have one out of two to the n possibilities. Each qubit can only be in one possible state. But since they're, they're truly orthogonal, these two qubits are orthogonal for one qubit, when you combine them, you get this tensor product and literally you get all two to the n possible permutations. You get the state where, where these two are zero and this one's in zero and one at the same time. That's what this means, okay? So what you get, for, for example, if Q is 300 qubits, you have two to the 300, which is so big that's greater than the number of particles in the known universe. So a 300 qubit quantum computer is bigger than if you used every molecule in the universe, every particle in the universe as part of a classical computer that was trying to do the same thing. And you know, it doesn't scale if you have things, you know, 30, you know, 35 uh, billion light years away from each other. So this is the magic of quantum computing is these quantum, quantum registers. 
and this exponential math-like explosion of state space um, that is, comes from quantum registers, okay? And so imagine if, like I said, if you had 300 qubits, um, we're gonna talk about what you can do with these things. And, and so far, um, if you have a three qubit system, then you get the beginning of what looks like regular computing. Um, Tom Toffley was a, IB, um, was a professor at MIT, and then he went over to another university um, in, um, in Boston. And then, but he basically came up in the, in the early 60s, I mean, in the early 70s and 80s, he, he came up with this Toffley gate. And it basically, it's, it's a control, control knot. So it's two of those control knot gates, and essentially it flips these states. And essentially you can write this mathematically as um, the exclusive or of C and AB, okay? And so this is the beginning of a Toffley gate. And with this, you can do not and an or. So now you can use a Toffley gate as a universal gate. It's reversible. You can go in either direction and you can have reversible computing that does not and an or. And you go, well, how is that possible? And the reason it is, is because you don't erase information. So whatever comes in B goes out on B. Likewise, what comes in on A and, 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 and you can reverse it. And so essentially you have the leftover from the and so that you know how you got there. So you know which of the states got there. And so the same thing with the Fredkin gate. Fredkin gate is a control swap. And, um, and this is also a universal quantum computer. You can do all of the kinds of things you would do with Toffley gates. And so now only when you have three qubits can you do the beginning of what we would call classical computing, okay? Done in a quantum computing setting, okay? So imagine if you have millions of gates that you're trying to do using this, then you would have to have three quantum bits to do a Toffley gate for every classical bit that you're trying to do. So you go, well, this seems like really hard to do. Well, it's the same thing is true with, with original quantum, you know, classical computers that were building semiconductors. You know, we didn't have very many um, transistors in our first system. So this is sort of the beginning. This is how you bootstrap yourself up to classical computing using quantum computing. Now, it turns out um, it's really hard to imagine all of this because every one of those is orthogonal. So imagine that you have a whole bunch of these dimensions. You can think of them as little sticks, little vectors. And, but any two that you pick are orthogonal to any other two. So it's really hard to imagine that. In fact, you can't embed that in three dimensions. So hyperdimensional space literally is not in 3D. It can't be. So this is an important consideration because, um, because you realize that's one of the reasons why quantum computing is so powerful is because you're cheating, you're not doing it in 3D anymore, okay? And if you were to think that these, each qubit is a point in a, in a high dimensional space, then if you had a hundred of these, you would have a hundred dimensional space, each one of them having two dimensions, a 200 dimensional space. And you can think of the point, a random point, a random phase in one of the quantum registers as two points. And you can say, well, you can actually, com you could compute the distance of that mathematically, you can. You can say, well, these two points, how far are they away in this space? And this is, you have to start thinking of distance in high dimen hyperdimensional space. And this distance is, is a mathematical distance. It doesn't actually exist. There's no actual metric space in there. It's more like a correlation distance rather than an actual distance. It uses the same math, but that's, that's okay. But because of this, you can't embed quantum computing inside three dimensions. You can build a quantum computer inside three dimensions, but the states that you're managing are not in three dimensions. It's like it's the gateway to the quantum states, but not the states themselves, okay? And because of that, you can't embed it in three dimensions, and you certainly can't embed it in a 2D hologram either. So anybody who has a universe, a picture of the universe that says, oh, here's a 2D hologram, and we can represent the universe as a 2D hologram, I say BS on that, because a 2D hologram does not allow you to represent um, a hyperdimensional space where it has the, all the anisotropic um, behavior, all the um, isotropic behaviors hyperdimensional space does because if you embed it in a lower dimensional space, you end up with an anisotropic um, set of properties, okay? So this is really, this is sort of my, my key strength is that I've spent enough time over the last 25 years looking at quantum computing and working on, on hyperdimensional math, um, both from a quantum computing and a neural computing perspective, 
that I can think like this now, okay? And that's really the hard part is thinking about hyperdimensional spaces, okay? So this is, this is hard, okay? So, so what do you do with all of this? If, if, if it doesn't look like a regular computer anymore, what do you do with it? Well, Peter Short figured out this mathematical trick. He found out that there is some math associated with it. He says, if you use a quantum Fourier transform in building it in a quantum computer, that you can solve, you can use these two to the Q simultaneous states to solve a problem that no classical computer can solve. And so he became famous for this in 1994. In fact, he was at my second conference. He was talking about this. And there's a, and there's a really good video out there that sort of tells you the math about why it works. Essentially, turns out if you're factoring primes, um, numbers, which is the basis of Shor's algorithm using quantum Fourier transform, essentially use quantum Fourier transform to get a better guess and because, and because of how quantum Fourier transform is discrete and, it's, and it finds something that's better than the other one, then it is quickly um, um, goes to the best answer and you can do this in quantum polynomial time. So not only he figured out that there was a class of killer apps for quantum computers, but a new complexity class too, quantum polynomial time. So this really spurred the beginning that quantum computing was fundamentally different than, than any other kind of computing because of Shor's algorithm. And that happened already 25, over 25 years ago, okay? And I've been thinking about this stuff this long. So you realize this is really hard to get your head around. And people like, really smart people like Peter Shor and other people too, there's another one um, that's used for sorting. You can, you can ser do search faster than you can do with any classical computing because you can do it the square root of n instead of n um, for search. Um, and so there's these all these algorithms now, quantum algorithms that have, speed up faster than the best classical algorithms, okay? And this is an example for it. In fact, everybody's trying to build classical quantum computers now so they can run Shor's algorithm to break the encryption codes on all of the internet that this, essentially this algorithm would allow you to break all the encryption codes on the internet that we use for secure computations because this factors prime, near prime, two prime numbers that are multiplied together and you can create this something that looks like a prime number um, and that um, is um, essentially the basis for Shor's algorithm, okay? So there's a, there's a movie out there called N, versus N equals NP or something like that. And it shows you if you could do that, what that would, what that would do. You know, it's a, it's a Netflix movie, I think, out there. So if you're interested in that kind of concepts, then you can go look at that. So, so the other thing that quantum computing does besides this qubit and quantum registers is it has this property called entanglement. Okay, so this is the two things, superposition and entanglement. These, and they each have their own name. You can have a single element of, that's an entangled qubit. So they call it, it has its own name now. It's, it's an ebit, it's a discrete thing. And you can have one entangled ebit. And the way it is, is you take two qubits and you combine them in a special way. So they are two qubits acting as one. Okay, this contains in a mathematical sense, it's called inseparable quantum states. The math looks like this. Remember, before I was showing you a quantum register that had four of these, it had 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, right? Well, the, these bells, this is the bell state, and this is the magic state. These states, it's like, think of this as a factoring. You can't, you can't pull a zero out of both sides, so you can't factor it. It's called inseparable. And these two qubits, these two states, are acting as one. And if you measure one, these two here are supposed to be the same. So you measure one and you get a zero out of one, then the other one is also gonna be a zero. In other words, if you collapse to this state, then both of them are zero. If you collapse to this state, both of them are one. But if you randomly pick which one, you don't know which one you're gonna get. But if you get one of these, then both sides will be the same. And likewise, you can pick this state here and you pick one, the other one's gonna be the opposite one, okay? And so the point is, is that that you have to specially prepare this. It's like a quantum entangled photon pair. And they use a special crystal where they use a high energy photon. It goes in and it causes this, interacts with the crystal and produces two low energy photons, lower energy photons that are entangled and they have this mysterious connection between them. But it's really this topological structure here that it's two things acting as one. In fact, in fact you can think of this exactly like a qubit, but a higher dimensional version of a qubit. And it's more obvious that you do this if you're in um, geometric algebra, which I'll show again about that in a minute. 
So I have these little iconic ways of representing this. This thing is, is really not, a, in, in, in Hilbert space math, this is called a vector, but I like to think about it as a bivector, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, but they're orthogonal just like the vector is, okay? And so you end up having these two qubits that are still connected, and, and you can have these far apart, and even if you have them far apart, um, like a light year away, they still interact in instantaneously, okay? And so this is what Einstein called, well, this is spooky action at a distance. It doesn't match what I know about relativity. And, um, and so he said, oh, well, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen said, well, it's spooky action at a distance. I don't believe it. It's wrong. Something's wrong with quantum mechanics. Um, and then they created these operators, but then John, John Bell in the 60s um, proved that it was true. And now there's building technology out of this. Um, they're using quantum key distribution systems using entangled states like this, okay? And they're using quantum key distribution systems from satellites, the Chinese are doing that. Okay, so this is real physics and it's real engineering. And it's just so counter to what we know because people like Einstein didn't believe in it, okay? That was one of his big failures that he, he did in his life because he didn't really understand that. And part of the reason you can't understand it is because they, as a physics community and engineering community, they keep thinking that it's in three dimensions. But as I'll show you here in a minute, it's really a four-dimensional object. And so you can't embed a four-dimensional object in a three-dimensional space. So that's where the problem comes in. And that's part of the story of my book too, is talking about, well, what does it really mean to have a hyperdimensional space? Okay, and that's one of the consequences of it is this, um, is this entangled state, okay? So entanglement is what we would call space-like because the non-locality connection is due to there being, it's a four-dimensional state. So every B bit contains four private dimensions. This isn't normal full-fledged dimensions like we think X, Y, and Z are, or even T is in our relativistic space-time. This is five private dimensions at the proto-dimensional level. Each qubit has its own private dimensions. And if it wasn't the case, they would interact. So you wouldn't be able to have separate E bits with their own private state. So this has to be, this has to be, it's not just mathematical. These dimensions mean something, okay? And it's self-consistent through these space-like states. So when I say, so this is a four-dimensional cube being rotated. And so it looks like a, looks like, it looks like a projection of itself. This is, this is the four-dimensional cube, but the best you can do in three dimensions is to show it as though it's a shadow of itself in three dimensions. And so we're trying to represent rotating that in four dimensions. And, and, and this, is, this is what it looks like, okay? But realize that these two ends of the qubit, of the e-bit, are far apart from each other. And so since they're far apart from each other, they interact in a way that's not inside the light cone. So this is right from physics. This is light-like as anything that, this is scaled so that light looks like a 45 degree angle in this space. And anything that's on light, travel at the speed of light in, in empty space, falls on the light cone like this. And anything that's classical or slower than the speed of light, like particles, they are what's called time-like, they're within the light cone. So anything inside this light cone can go through the now and end up in the other side of the light cone. But anything that's outside of this means that they are things that cannot interact with something else because they're, they're too far apart in time or to distance or too far apart in time to interact using light. And so it's, physics has a name for that. It's called space-like. And these are two examples of space-like things. You can have things that are too far apart or they're too far apart and they're in the future and you can't reach them either with light. Okay, well, my research, and this is the understanding of the mathematics is E-bits are space-like, okay? And once you understand that, you go, well, that's why they're so weird, okay? And what one of the things my research showed is that these E-bits are actually entangled. And I'll talk about that in a slide in a little bit at the end. And I believe that dark matter and dark energy are also four dimensional and they are also entangled. And that comes right out of the math um, that I did um, about 10 years ago with Mike Manthe. And it, it comes right out of the topology of the math that I'm doing with geometric algebra. And by the way, I have a whole talk that I did a couple months ago where I have a tool written in Python that allows you to, it's a, it's a, it's a symbolic math package in geometric algebra, and it's integrated in with the Python um, 
read about print loop. So you can actually go in and create these states and interact with them like you would uh, Mathematica. So if anybody wants that, there is that talk out there that I did a couple months ago on my website about um, the geometric algebra tool. So you could go download it and start playing with it. Um, and, and you're welcome to do that. So it's not, it's not on, it, I, you'd have to, I'd have to get the, you'd have to get the link from me, but it's in the, the, the link is actually um, probably in that video. So, um, so what does all of this mean? Well, first of all, anybody who's paying attention, like IBM, Google, and Microsoft are all saying, well, we want this quantum computer stuff, okay? Because we don't know what it's good for, but it's cool. And so everybody's investing billions of dollars worldwide on, on quantum computers. If you don't know about it, it's just this giant investment. And it's been going on ever since, ever for the last 15, 20 years now. And they're finally to the point where they have enough science and physics and technology that they can build greater than 50, 50 qubits, okay? And we'll talk about why 50 qubits is important, okay? Um, and, but everybody who's working on this quantum computing race, they're all using different technologies. You know, D-Wave was one of the first ones and they're not doing a general purpose quantum computing. They're called a simulated annealing quantum computer. And so they do um, simulated annealing style quantum computing, but they have a thousand, 2000, 4000 qubit uh, a bit quantum computer, but it doesn't do, it can't run Shor's algorithm, okay? So D-Wave is a special case, but IBM, Google, Microsoft, Intel, all of these have 35 to 75 qubits already. And they all look like this, where they drop this into a vat of liquid hydrogen and they produce a quantum computer that's very, very cold and it keeps all the noise out, okay? And the killer app again is Shor's algorithm. We would love to be able to, to, do, to run Shor's algorithm on one of these computers, okay? And so you can show that you can do that. Um, so what does this all mean? Well, everybody's working on it. IBM has 50 qubits, Google has 72 qubits, Intel has 49 qubits. I don't know how many qubits are in Microsoft when I wrote this slide. D-Wave again has thousands of qubits. Um, they call it adiabatic computing. Um, but everybody's working on this, but they're also all working on AI. In fact, um, Google has not only bought a D-Wave computer, but it's also building its own quantum computer. So they're, they're, they're going whatever they can. Plus they're working on all the AI stuff and the AI stuff uh, includes their TensorFlow and AlphaGo chip stuff. Plus they're working on high performance computing. I mean, so you, you can think of everybody wants these, the, the biggest muscle they can in the computing domain. And the way you do that is with quantum computing, high performance computing, like FPGA computing. That's what Microsoft is doing with Azure. Azul, Azure, um, their system is they have FPGA computing integrated in with their um, class, with their computers on their network. And neuromorphic computing is what um, Intel is doing with their, um, well, IBM is also using the term neuromorphic, but anybody who's doing a chip that's using neural like modeling to do AI, rather than what they're doing with deep learning and um, the stuff like TensorFlow, there's multiple ways of looking at um, learning, okay, and, and AI. So, so, so the point is, is that they may even be able to figure out how to use quantum computing to do neural computing. Nobody knows how to do that yet, but they're interested in, in all of this stuff. So this is important to realize that this is a huge investment on all of these levels, okay? And the only other thing that's probably as big as this is um, space, space, you know, there's billions of dollars being put in space right now to go to space. So there's billions of dollars being put on these topics in the, in the industry right now. Um, and it's all over the world. It's not just in the US. Um, so, 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 well, what does all of these quantum states mean? And I, and I've tried to summarize this by saying, well, quantum states essentially are more primitive than the classical universe. So these quantum states really probably the basis for the simulator for the universe. So the classical world must emerge from the quantum states because you can't do it the other way around. You can't simulate entanglement in a classical world because this non-locality doesn't exist at the physical level in the classical world. But anytime you have a simulator, the simulation is separate from the simulator. In other words, the thing, if you're, if you're flying an airline, if you're flying an airplane simulator, you don't actually, you see the airplane simulation, but you don't see the computer underneath it. You know, you don't have that ability. But this, this cartoon here by Dilbert made me laugh because it's kind of making fun of that whole idea. Dilbert says, I created a simulated world and made entirely of software. 
I pro programmed all the people in the simulator to think they are real people with free will. And the dog says, are they sentient beings? Well, they think they are, says Dilbert. What if they discover their true nature, says Dilbert, you know, the, the dog bird. He says, I programmed limits into their physics so they can never observe the walls of their reality. For example, they can't go to the edge of the universe because they can't exceed the speed of light. And they cannot find out what they are because they're made of because to them, it looks like probability at the quantum level. And then Dogger says, well, wouldn't those limits tip off the start smart ones? And Gilbert says, I coded them to not trust smart people. This is funny at so many different levels because first of all, you can't do it with software. As you know, any kind of software runs on some kind of computational engine. And that computational engine, it turns out, is a quantum computer. So in the physical universe. And so if you have the physical universe requires is the resource for all the quant, all the physical quantum computing. So the quantum infrastructure is required to simulate efficiently simulate a quantum system. You, you can't do it any other way. And, and um, Feynman is well known for saying that the fastest way to compute a quantum system is to use a quantum system to do it. That's why people are interested in quantum computers because they are trying to use quantum systems to do quantum things because you can't simulate it. So I'm gonna give you an example of, of this, what I call this notion of concurrency and space and time and how they're related to an information, okay? So here's, a, here's what we call the coin demo, okay? Act one. A person stands with both hands behind his back, okay? His or her back. The person now shows a hand containing a coin and then hides it again. So the person again shows a coin, indistinguishable from the first, could be the same or not, we don't know. And then they ask, how many coins do I have? Well, the answer is, it, this represents one bit. It either has one coin or greater than one coin. But so the question is, will be answered with a with a one bit if you find the answer to that, okay? So the question then is, is now the person holds out a hand showing two identical coins. So here it says, we just received one bit because we now know that it was greater than one coin. So here's the big question is, this is called a co-occurrence. It's, it's the, the same kind of a co-occurrence that happens in the bits and qubits. This is a qubit essentially. So where did that bit of information come from as, as it turns out? And the answer is from the simultaneous presence of the two coins, okay? And so if you've created information or delete information, essentially it's Landauer's principle is in effect. So, so you got information and so there's an effective energy. So combining two states essentially is an effective energy, has an effective energy. And we believe that the, the bit dimensions that form the primitive universe before the Big Bang, essentially you've created the information and the energy of the Big Bang came from the collapsing of these states and having them to start interacting with each other. And we call this non-Shannon space-like information and it's derived from the simultaneity, okay? So this is a really, interesting experiment and it's a and it's it, and you can't do most of what we do with Shannon information and Turing computing is all about sequential computing but it doesn't represent this kind of computing or information at all and so and and it means that you can now have two bits that are running completely and concurrently like you do in an e, like you do in a quantum computer or qubit or an e-bit and they're completely independent of each other's processes and they can run them concurrently and yet they interact in a controlled way. And that's sort of the basis for quantum computing but it's also the basic for quantum physics as well, okay? So, so what does it look like then? So you have plus, you have token A and token B or you can have token B and token A. If you were to do that, you had some abstract space, you were saying plus, well, they're concurrent. Well, that means at the same, some point abstract time, they're concurrent that's what this plus means. Plus means concurrency. So anytime you see a plus in geometric algebra, this is geometric algebra, but if also anytime you see a plus in Hilbert space math, this means concurrent. Well, we all know from relativity, you can't truly have recurrent, concurrent things because it's totally relativistic. So there's something about quantum computing that says things could truly, truly be concurrent because if they weren't, they would cease to be existing as the thing that they were because they were concurrent. So this, this is a space-like operator, it's a plus because it's in time, and then that's called a co-occurrence. And then this is that if this space state is found and later this other state is found, this is called a co-exclusion. It means that these two states can't occur. This is a classical coin 
you can have more complex states than just a classical coin. They can't occur. They, they subtract, they cancel each other. They can't occur. And this zero now means in geometric algebra, it means cannot occur and it's an important state. Um, you not only do you have plus and minus one in geometric algebra, but you have this zero, it's like tri-state logic and it comes right out of the topological mathematics of it. So um, this is again, another very deep topic. So here you can find that just addition and multiplication in order to get this state here, this co-exclusion, you have to have an operator that converted one state to another state because they're mutually exclusive. So like an inversion gate. So if you have this, you have some kind of operator and then you have this time, you have abstract time proceeding because state is changing. It's not real time like we know it, it's some abstract time um, and that's important to realize. So you realize that now you're beginning, you have proto space and proto time that's not tie, tied with the physical time that we have of classical space time or relativistic space time. It can't be, it has to be more primitive than that. So again, this is a deep subject um, and, and it's not relativistic. That's the key point here. So, so let's talk about the quantum observer effect, okay? So this is, um, uh, I think I've got some slides here from the kind of thing that was in the Dr. Quantum um, um, video that was out there, okay? And the idea here is the double slit experiment proves that the quantum wave behavior, okay? So this is regular, this is regular physics. This was done in early 1800s and then they finally figured it out in the late 1800s and early 1900s that everything is really a wave. If you have a single photon or a single electron, you can put it through this double slit. It essentially interacts with itself, it's because it's a wave, and you see this um, distribution pattern, um, pattern on the screen, okay? This is the natural double slit experiment. And believe it or not, everything works like this. So go, go see Dr. Quantum's video on this, okay? But you, you know, the historical way we says, well, they were particles really, but no, you can't have particles going in and have waves coming out. But so the question is, is it particle or wave? But if you observe it, so this is like a little eye here. If you observe it, even after it's gone through the barrier here, it collapses into a particle. So it doesn't have this wave property anymore. So, so this whole notion of collapse of the particles is important. It's a deep philosophical topic. And, and it talks about the observer effect. This is why they talk about the observer effect. And people really don't know what this means because what is the observer? Can it be another instrument? Or can it be that, that the instrument is also in a quantum superposition like, like um, uh, Schrodinger's cat, and it's only when a human looks at it. Does this have to eye actually have to be a human eye or not? It's part of the discussion. And you know, again, you'll find all kinds of topics about that on the on the internet. Some people says, well, any 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 eye is good, even a classical eye. Okay, well, that's that's all interesting and good. And so so, but it does collapse the wave function. It does act like a, as a measurement. So you can't you can't look at it and have it still be a quantum system anymore because it collapses. The, look, the act of looking at it causes a measurement to occur, okay? So, so now what we're gonna do is, I mean, this is physics, okay? So now what I'm gonna switch is switch to the, and this is quantum computing and this is physics. And this is important if you're doing any of those things, okay? So now what we're gonna do is switch to sort of like the intro to the kinds of things I'm looking at my book. All of this stuff is related to what I'm gonna talk about here. So here there's this project, I'm gonna show you three examples of this. I'm just using this to justify why as an engineer, I wrote my book, okay? So there was this project called the Global Cost Consciousness Project. Essentially, it was inspired by individual random number generators. And this pair lab I'm telling you about is Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. And uh, the Dean of Engineering in Princeton in, this, in the early 80s and before that, um, set up this lab to study this kind of things. And he, through the years, they finally set up this Global Consciousness Project because they were interested in well, what if random number generators around the world really weren't random? What if this random number generators that we think should be 50-50 running all the time um, weren't? And they found evidence of this at a small scale. So they were looking at it for a global scale. And so they set up 70, 70 sites. They've been monitoring and cataloging all this data for over 15 years. And they're looking for global events that change probabilities. And they found that there's coherent emotion can cause change. And they have identified over 500 events like this, okay? And this is what it looks like. This is a P, a, a probability distribution here that says a probability of less than 0.05. And you can see that these 
events for the 9-11 attack showed that they were, um, the probabilities were changing outside the probability of 50-50, okay? And you look at it from a perspective of um, information theory, you end up that you can say, well, is, what's, the like, what's the odds of this data that's being correlated with this terrorist attack to be information? And it shows up as an information signal. It says somehow this distribution shifting looks weird from an information perspective. And remember you said, if you're creating information, you're essentially you're, 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 you're creating, you're changing the entropy of something in a way and, and it shows up in the randomness of this. And you go, how is that possible? And then you look at this and this is the, take all those 500 events and you, and you normalize, you, know, you include them all in this and you find that the probabilities are, are ones in billions. You know, here's the P-scores and, and this. And, well, how is it even possible that something that's purely random could not be random anymore? Okay, this was what the engineering group at Princeton was looking at over the last 30, 40 years, okay? And this is one of their outcomes, okay? So this one particularly got me at my attention. Um, this is a big one. Um, and, you know, Dean Ray, and, you know, when, when uh, Roger, Robert, Roger Nelson was doing this, but he was working with a Dean of Engineering at Princeton, which was called um, Robert John is his name, J-A-H-N. And when he finally, when he finally shut the lab down at Princeton after 40 years, he says, well, we've got so much evidence that this stuff exists, but nobody believes us yet. So, you know, it's like, and, and, and Roger, uh, Roger, um, Robert John, um, he wrote an article for IEEE magazine in 1981 and 82, I think it was 82. And so you can go find that out there. And he says, engineers should be interested in this. And, and I took that to heart because I'm interested in why, why is it possible that we don't have a good model for computing or information theory to account for this kind of stuff, okay? So, so the significance is that these unusual statistics usually are due to deeper physics foundation. This is the same thing that's true with um, um, Bell states and um, entanglement states. Entanglement allows you to have statistics that are not possible with classical physics. That's what the Bell, Bell's theorem is all about, okay? You, you get correlations that shouldn't be there. This is that kind of probability. So if you have unusual statistics, most likely you have unusual physics as the foundation for that. It's also the basis for Bose, Bose-Einstein constant and stuff like that. They had to change the, the way of looking at probabilities um, so things, so that the probabilities were computed differently in order to understand bosons and things like that. Okay? But here's another one, number two, the mind observes quantum states. So here's a double slit experiment done, done by Dean Radin, he's in California. He uses a closed and shielded double slit with photo detectors. So it's a completely automated system and it has a photo detector in the back and he has uh, an entangled photon that's a single atomic photo photon going through both slits and he's measuring that wave wave distribution like that so what he does is he has people on the net sign up to influence this this device so you can think of this as this mental mental eye here uh, for um, concentrating and they change the probability they actually can measure this Okay, and you go so, and it worked remotely on online volunteers. So the significance is, first of all, this is the observer effect with nothing looking at it except pure consciousness. And this is, brings out this, the whole notion, what kind of observer do we need to change quantum states? To me, this is fundamentally different because it says something about quantum states and intention are related to quantum states that they, they can interact. Remember, this isn't electromagnetic at all, it's remote and it's got Faraday cage shielding. So this is a fundamental research. Um, some people have said that Dean Radin's research should get a Nobel Prize for this because it's like so fundamental. Um, put it this way, there are people who have got Nobel Prize for a lot less, okay? So this is a great experiment, he's done it. The other one is my co-author, co Dean uh, William Tiller. He and his team figured out how to build this intention host device. It looks, it looks simple, it looks like a garage door opener. And it basically is a resonant device and you can program it using meditation, which he is a 50 year meditator. And you can program the meditation for different effects. You can have, you can say, I want the pH of water to go up or down. And then you can put it in the lab in a closed system and the pH of water actually goes up or down based on your intention. So this intention host device can directly affect laboratory experiments. This, in order for this to do this, 
the energy of this closed system looks like it changed due to intention. And this intention is not coming from a human, it's coming from an intention that's been encoded in this intention host device. Okay, so now you know why I wrote the book with William Tiller because his research is fundamental. It's kind of like Dean Radin's and the consciousness experiment. So, and he did four kinds of lab effects. And I talk about this in the book is he did organic, inorganic, living and non-living, okay? And so thoughts are not due to neural mechanisms. That's the big thing about this. And that's kind of the same thing as the previous one either, the last two as well is like, how is it possible? We think we know what AI is and we think we know that the AI thoughts come from the brain and therefore we're building AI systems. And we think we have a handle on all that. And I say BS on that because these experiments say we don't have a clue. Okay, so these are the justifications of why I wrote the book. And so here's the book, hyperdimensional qubits are fundamental since they expose an infinite qubit reality that is the basis for what I would call real intelligence. In other words, these properties that humans can exhibit, that's real intelligence, not the artificial intelligence that they're doing in Google and places like that. And so this as an engineer, I'm very interested in these things. This, this is the next generation for real intelligence. And I can argue, I would say, I would say that quantum computing and quantum physics is the gateway science to this kind of what I call source science, okay? And I even got Dean Radin to review my book and he gave me, he's, it's the top, um, uh, you know, the endorsement of the book. And he wrote this about my book and, you know, he, he gets what I'm trying to say and he, and we call it source science. So quantum computing is the gateway to source science, essentially. If you're interested in quantum computing, then you should be interested in source science as well, because it's talking about the same kind of things at the next level. So, um, so here's the source science model. Information is physical. That's the same thing uh, as Ralph Landauer said. Universe is hyperdimensional. That's what we already showed that. Quant and, and Richard Feynman says that nature isn't classical, damn it. It's quantum mechanical. So, so as soon as you start getting your head around it's quantum mechanical, then it's hyperdimensional. And then you have EBITs having their, their private dimensions and spooky action at a distance and all that. Then you realize the universe really is hyperdimensional. Get your head around it. Start figuring out what to do with it. And as an engineer, that's what I'm interested in doing it. And then ultimately, because of all of these non-local effects um, from the three I showed you, the mind is really probably separate from the brain. Tiller says the same thing. A lot of other people say that. And the mind is really outside space and time. And Tiller calls it a bio-body suit. The mind, the mental interacts with the bio-body suit. So the brain is more of an antenna than it is this, okay? And people like wrote Robert Monroe, who has been a scientist, an engineer also, working on this stuff, uh, uh, consciousness-related subjects, he defined the term rotes, where these little structures, topological structures that contain meaning. So um, quantum meaning structures. And so, um, and so meaning is hyperdimensional and space-like as well. And that's part of this term correlisms that came from the neural research that we did. As soon as you have a hyperdimensional space, you automatically have cor correlisms. And this has this um, correlated space like that, okay? So um, we're getting to the end here. Um, I'm gonna go through these this is the way I would write it in geometric algebra instead of the way I showed you before. And there's a couple of videos out there already about this and more, but you can take a single qubit. This, I showed you that. You can take two qubits. This is a qubit. This is what it would look like in Hilbert space. This is what it looks like in um, geometric algebra. And you have this thing called a bivector here. And essentially, anytime you have two vectors, you also have their product, which they're, since they're this is a geometric product, then this looks like an outer product, and this becomes a, a grade up. This is a one grade up. So this thing here, which looks like two bits, is really a bivector now, and that's the structure that's the beginning of the structure that doesn't show up in Hilbert space, okay? This by, this by structure, this thing here is important because mathematically, this bivector squared is equal to minus one because it's anti-commutative. So this is the basis for complex numbers, but using a geometric algebra. So you don't need complex numbers, you can just use bivectors and it's much simpler, okay? And you can get qubits and neutrinos and bosons out of this, and I'll show you what that means, looks, looks like in a minute, but you can also get qtrits, um, three-dimensional version, tri-vectors, and you can get um, a three-dimensional object, a volume object, and it turns out when you do that, you end up with quaternions, which is basis for math and physics. Um, and, um, and you can also, from that, you could get quarks, photons, gluons, mesons, electrons, and neutrinos. 
So notice that this is a two-dimensional space and I'm saying that you have qubits in there, but it turns out you also have neutrinos and WZ bosons. In other words, some of these particles aren't complex enough to be three-dimensional yet, but most of the stuff we normally think about are three-dimensional like quarks and electrons and neutrinos. So this is, this is the prediction that we made. And so these are the operators I did for my PhD. I'm gonna introduce you to one more thing about e-bits, four-dimensional space. So if you have two qubits, A and B, and you represent them as vector A0 and A1, this looks just like the Hilbert spacer thing. And then you have the Q, Q, you have these the spinners, which are the bivectors, which is these products, outer product like this. And then you can take the, what looks like the tensor product, but it's really the geometric product. The geometric product of this gives you the tensor product. You don't have to have a special operator for that. And so you end up with this is actually, this is what the quantum register looks like in in Hilbert space and the same, it looks almost as identical in geometric algebra, except, except that these are vectors in Hilbert space and these are bivectors in, 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 in um, my geometric algebra, okay? So that's the difference. And fundamentally, you can get e-bits out of this too. You can get entangled photons, entangled states. In fact, the Bell operator here is the sum of these two spinners. And that's what it looks like in the magic operator. And if you apply these out, you take A times B and you get times the Bell operator or the magic operator, you get the Bell, you get the Bell states and the magic states, and these states are entangled. And I showed for my, dis for my dissertation that the Bell and magic operators are singular. In other words, in geometric algebra, because you can't find the inverse of them. So that means that they do this and the way they do that, I proved that entanglement is irreversible due to multiplicative cancellation. Again, an important result from my dissertation from 20 years ago already. Um, and it's because of in, in information erasure in geometric algebra. So everything I've been talking about comes to a head right here on this slide where entanglement now is really special in geometric algebra because it's irreversible, it's, it's entangled. Um, and, and, it's, and you can't undo it because it's, and it's because these states here um, when you multiply them times the, the, the operators, um, they cancel half the states. And if they cancel them, you can't go back without, you, you've erased them. So it's, irre it's multiplicative cancellation and it's kind of uh, irreversibility, okay? So, so this, is, this is very important work. I'm trying to get, trying to get this word out that, that this is a fundamental way of looking at it just because we use a different math. It has a slightly different structure than uh, Hilbert space does, but it uh, but it does all the same things except you interpret it differently. So, okay. So so once once you have these, remember I talked about quaternions are a three dimensional version. Well, it turns out there's a higher dimensional version of quaternions called we call them tau quaternions, and essentially they're the sum of these quaternions. But you're in a three dimensional space, so you have up to six of these, and so these are what the quaternions look like, and you have um, the bell and magic states are literally nothing more than um, the bell state is this, the magic state is this, and um, the, these, these states here are the bell and magic states, okay, the, and we call them Tachornian states, and what you can find is that they have exactly the same properties as the quaternions, including that their square is equal to one, uh, their Q, that you can square them and they get to uh, minus one, but this minus one is a sparse version of minus one. It's a higher dimensional version of minus one because half the states are zero and the other half are one, either minus one or plus one. So you end up with these properties that look like this, even though you have a sparse distributed, you have a sparse version of the matrix, okay? And this is all because it comes right out of the topology of geometric algebra and the anti-commutative properties, okay? So as you can see, I geek out on this stuff. And here's, the, here's the charts that show that it's exactly like, um, quaternions, and we call them Tachornians because they're four-dimensional versions of that. Um, so what you can do with it, this is just a couple more slides now and I'll be done. Um, so if you have a single bit, it just looks like this. So I'm trying to do the standard model now in geometric algebra. And if you go to, to, to a qubit, you notice that there's room in this structure for another neutrino. And we found that there's actually another neutrino. Um, there's not just three, but there's four because of the top topological constraints on this. And, and in G2, you have two things which are called bosons because you can look that their state of this is square is zero. Okay, bosons, are these, these are particles, their square is one. 
and these um, and these our square is zero. So you can easily solve for these in geometric algebra using the tool that you can download for me if you want. Likewise, you can do protons and neutrons, photons, these other bosons, and you find that there's another boson in there that didn't show up yet. And this might be the, the famous X17 boson that they think is, it's a low energy photon. Um, but, it, um, but you end up with electrons and plus you end up with another whole set of electrons, which is the chirality version, the other chirality version of the electrons. So you end up with twice as many electrons. And then we can show that the Higgs boson and the dark bosons and the dark energy dimensional. So this is a different way of looking at the standard model, knowing that it's using graded geometry instead of just high dimensional math, okay? And so we've showed, we have the fourth neutrino, we have the additional boson, the bell states are 4D, all the bell states are 4D quaternions, tau quaternions, and the bell operator is reversible, the Higgs boson is 4D and, and it's a boson, and the dark matter and dark energy are also 4D, 4D which means everything that we find mysterious about physics is either four dimensional or two dimensional. Like neutrinos are really hard to measure. Well, if they're only two dimensional, that might make sense why that they, they, uh, that they are hard to measure because they're only two dimensional instead of three dimensional, okay? So, so I'm gonna say that's, this is why I think real intelligence is so much different than artificial intelligence because humans represent real intelligence because they demonstrate the generalized learning. So we have to look at AI again from this, manage meaning even before language. They're massively parallel, even though they have really slow neurons. So maybe they're tapping into the quantum like speed ups and most likely our brain is an antenna. And that's not only my idea, it's other people's. Um, so intention can directly affect quantum states, the double slit experiment, the intention host device, the global consciousness project. Um, humans exhibit non-local behaviors. Um, you would call these, um, some people wouldn't even call this science, but, but remote viewers, I personally know remote viewers, I've done it myself. Space and time are properties that our humans can seem to know information across space and across time. So how is that possible? Well, if you have a representation for thoughts that exists outside of space time, then that might be the basis for it. So you have all these space-like and wave-like mental states. I call these source-like just as a general topic for it, but they're basically wave-like meaning. Meaning is not the same as data. Knowing is not the same as a fact. Awareness is like everywhere and nowhere. Same thing with consciousness is there have been consciousness conferences for the last 25 years. Nobody knows what it is yet. Any, and anything about like transcendent states, like um, if I'm a meditator or anything like that, what are those states? What, how do we even talk about that? Um, so those are all things that are, um, that are part of real intelligence. Humans do these things, but machines will never do this. We dream. So, so that's sort of like, so this is sort of the last slide now. This is quantum. Quantum is fundamental. Okay. So, so following emerges, the following emerges from quantum information. You have all of these quantum properties. You have the strange physics properties. You have all the particles. You have the energy. All of this quantum stuff and computational stuff comes from bits and you can show and you can come from bits. And these bits are really their own dimensions. You have an infinite dimensional quantum bit framework. I call them proto dimensions. And I say quantum computing is fundamental since it exposes this infinite quantum bit reality of the entire universe, okay? And that's the end of the talk. And so hopefully you've been able to keep up with me because I've had a lot to say, but there's other videos out there that take what I just talked about and expand it into three one hour talks instead of one one hour talk. So. So hopefully I've encouraged, I've, I've enticed you to think about it the way I do it and that you would be interested in going up and following up more about what I've, what I've said about my book. So that's what the book is about is tying those things um, and going into the math um, in a way, hopefully that's accessible by people who are not mathematicians. So, so with that, I'm opening up for questions. I'm gonna um, stop sharing now. So, um, and we'll start asking questions. So. Oops. Well, I, uh, well, thank you, Doug. This is Luis. My, my video is turned off. Yeah. My, my hair and brain is smoking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this, I think that's good. <laughs> if, if, if I even get 25% of what you said, that would be wonderful. <laughs> but uh, I mean, some of the concepts are pretty classical, but there's a lot of the new stuff, of course, about quantum 
kill bits, e bits, and all that that I'm not that familiar with. But right, th right. Thank you very much for that information. And if I get a chance, I'll take a look at your book. If I can understand that first chapter, I think I'll be doing good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you have to realize that, you know, maybe science, there are a lot of people who are controlling science are classical physics people. They're not even.